Hi, these are the week two slides uh, talking about learning unit two, which is covering cellular level of organization, the digestive system, and nutrition. Um, so keep in mind that we're kind of continuing to build off of some ideas from last week. Um, so specifically thinking about digestive physiology. So last week we talked kind of about the different structures involved in the digestive system. We covered some ideas about cells and tissue levels of organization to support this and to understand unique structures of the digestive system. And in lab, you talked about calorimetric tests. This week, we're going to be talking more about digestive physiology, metabolism, and nutrition. So how exactly does stuff get broken down in the digestive system and what happens to it after it's absorbed? In lab, you'll be covering enzymes. Um, so these ideas will tie together nicely because we'll be talking a lot about digestive hydrolytic enzymes today. For the learning objectives, again, we're kind of tying together those ideas between lab and lecture. So you should be thinking about different locations of secretions. Um, so identifying the locations and secretions involved in digestion and absorption, specifically of different macromolecules. So again, thinking back to that chemical level of organization and also micronutrients. Um, in the second chapter that we cover, you should kind of think about the fate of these specific byproducts of digestion, so the different monomers of those macromolecules. How ultimately do they go on to serve us in our body? Um, I also want to apologize in advance. I have kind of a gnarly cold, so if I start coughing or if I lose my voice, I am deeply sorry for that. Okay, the first thing that I wanted to cover was reflection number two. Um, remember that your first reflection was kind of more of a getting to know you situation. The second reflection had actual questions. Um, so sometimes when I ask you questions, I don't expect you to know the answer. Uh, obviously that would not be the case on a quiz or an exam, but on reflections or different activities, I do want you to kind of push yourself out of your comfort zone and start maybe making hypotheses or tying together ideas where you're not exactly sure what the answer is, but you're starting to put together those ideas. So I know it might have been uncomfortable when you were doing your reflection, but I do want to cover what are kind of the expected answers for those prompts. So I'll go through each question uh, on those prompts and kind of say what I was thinking or hoping you would get to. So for this first question, remember we're thinking about the digestion and absorption of the lactose sugar in an infant. Um, we're thinking about what organs and structures did the lactose sugar pass through before reaching the small intestine. Um, so lactose sugar is a uh, small disaccharide. It's not fully broken down yet, uh, but it makes its way through your body. And so this is basically just asking you, what are the structures of the alimentary canal? Where does food actually pass through versus accessory structures? So we're not thinking about stuff like the um, salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, we're thinking about the actual alimentary canal. So it would pass through the mouth, the pharynx and the throat, uh, the esophagus and the stomach before finally reaching the small intestine. So I mentioned that lactose is a relatively small disaccharide. Um, when we think about that word lactose, remember that anything that ends in O-S-E is a sugar. And keeping that uh, naming convention in mind today is going to be particularly helpful. Um, lactose is a disaccharide. It's made up of glucose and galactose, which are much simpler sugars. They're um, sugar monomers, monosaccharides. And so lactose can actually be broken down further. And it's a little bit too big to uh, just pass through into the tissue of uh, kind of lining the small intestine. There's a very specific type of transport that's involved there and the sugar has to be broken down into a monosaccharide in order to pass through. So lactose is a disaccharide, not a monosaccharide. Carbohydrates have to be broken down fully into monosaccharides before they can be absorbed as glucose, galactose, or fructose. Um, and so we're gonna talk about different types of transport in a little bit, 
glucose and galactose are both transported into the cells of the villi um, and then additionally into blood. Um, first, they're transported into those villi cells using secondary active transport. Active transport means that it costs your body ATP to accomplish this. Um, and we'll talk specifically about what secondary active transport means in a little bit. The next question was, what do you think happens to the molecules that are produced when lactase enzyme acts on lactose sugar? Again, remember lactase, uh, ASE tells you that it's an enzyme. Lact tells you a little bit about what it does. So lactase is an enzyme that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. So this question is asking you, what does your body do with glucose? What does it do with galactose? Why are we interested in absorbing those from our food? Um, so what is the fate of glucose? Glucose is very important for cellular energy. It's involved in a lot of cell energy pathways, both anabolically and catabolically, which we'll unpack in a little bit. Um, it's really important for cellular respiration, specifically glycolysis. So glucose is a huge source of energy for our cells. Galactose is involved in neural development. Uh, it can also be converted into a form of glucose, UDP glucose, um, which is then important as a precursor for making many molecules, including glycogen, which is a storage molecule for glucose. So we'll think about some of those pathways in the second chapter that we cover. So the last question was, why do you think lactose intolerance is more common in adults than in infants? So uh, when I was reading through your responses, I kind of saw a lot of different um, thoughts about this, uh, specifically about understanding DNA and protein relationships. So remember that in every single one of your cells, you have this cookbook of all of your DNA that makes you who you are. The difference is just whether those proteins that are coded for by the DNA are actually expressed in a given cell. So in every cell in your body that has a nucleus, you have a gene for the lactase enzyme. Uh, the only difference is whether that lactase enzyme is actively produced. So when we are infants, there is an evolutionary advantage to code for and express that protein, that lactase enzyme. The reason for this is that breast milk is 7% lactose. It is heavily lactose. So it's 88% water, 7% lactose. There's way more lactose sugar specifically than there even is fat or protein in breast milk. Um, so it's advantageous to be able to produce that lactase enzyme as an infant. Um, also, as adults, we have fully formed gut my, uh, microbial communities where if we don't produce lactase enzyme, our bacteria usually do, uh, so they end up kind of uh, breaking it down, um, which might be helpful for us, but also has a lot of really undesirable side effects. So a lot of gut issues that we associate with lactose intolerance are due to those gut bacteria. Uh, if you're not actively eating a lot of milk or dairy as an adult, then there's no evolutionary pressure to keep producing that lactase enzyme. So uh, enzymes take a lot of energy to produce. Our bodies are doing a lot of other stuff. So if we don't really need to produce it, there's less of an ev evolutionary pressure to do so. In the bottom right over here, you can see uh, the prevalence of lactose intolerance in specifically adults by country. So you can see that uh, in countries where maybe there's a high prevalence of dairy in the diet or uh, countries that have been colonized by people who eat a lot of dairy, um, there might be more of an evolutionary advantage to continuing to produce that lactase enzyme into adulthood uh, because you are dependent on that food source. Um, but for much of the world, there's no evolutionary pressure to keep producing lactase. So that evolutionary tie-in is not necessarily something that you will be tested on. Uh, the other parts of this prompt are very important for you to understand in terms of digestive physiology, um, but thinking about that relationship between DNA and protein is something that you want to keep in mind. And also the energetics of putting together proteins anabolically, that's also something you want to keep in mind.
Okay, so getting into chapter 23 and finishing that up, uh, last week we went through sections uh, 1 through 6, but today we're going to specifically talk about section 7 from chapter 23. So you should focus on understanding how specific macromolecules are digested and absorbed. Um, that's going to help you understand enzymes and metabolism. So when we're thinking about chemical digestion rather than mechanical digestion, that's really getting into these building blocks um, that make molecules. So kind of getting stuff down into its constituent parts uh, so that we can absorb it into our bodies and do stuff with it. So we're going to think about where that's happening, how that's happening, um, specifically for different types of macromolecules. So when we're thinking about how this happens, um, a lot of it comes down to enzymatic hydrolysis. And when we think about that word hydrolysis, hydro means water is involved in some way. Lysis means splitting. So in this example, we have a disaccharide. Um, enzymatically, it's being connected to a water molecule. Um, and so the OH is going to connect with one of those monosaccharides that remaining H is going to connect with the other monosaccharide that splits the molecule into two separate molecules, um, makes it, those two separate molecules stable. And so we have hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is taking place inside of the alimentary canal, specifically in the mouth, the lumen of the stomach, and the lumen of the small intestine. Remember that the bulk of chemical digestion is happening within the lumen of the small intestine. Um, and so those uh, secretions, the enzymatic hydrolysis, the, the stuff that actually accomplishes that is coming from very specific glands. So in the mouth, it's coming from saliva, which is coming from the salivary glands. In the lumen of the stomach, we have gastric glands producing gastric juice. Uh, we also have exocrine glands, or so those are the exocrine glands that line the stomach. Um, in the small intestine, we have a couple of different things involved. We have secretions from the cells lining the intestine itself. So we call that the brush border um, of the microvilli. So when we talk about brush border enzymes, we're talking about enzymes that are being secreted by cells on uh, lining the villi, so those microvilli cells. Uh, we also have secretions coming from the liver and the gallbladder and specifically the exocrine pancreas. So there's specific enzymes that are involved in this. Um, you do not need to memorize all of these enzymes and where they're specifically produced, but I do want you to start practicing thinking about some of these words. So recognizing, for example, that maltase is probably an enzyme that breaks apart the sugar maltose. Understanding that peptidases are probably involved in breaking down protein in some way because protein has peptide bonds. Understanding that lipases are involved in lipid digestion. So you should start kind of learning these terms and being able to apply them accordingly. So we're going to focus on each of the different macromolecules in turn and think about their digestion. Um, when we have carbohydrates being broken down, remember that in the case study we had lactose, that was a disaccharide, it wasn't broken down enough. We really have to get these into the form of monosaccharides using different enzymes depending on what type of sugar we have. So if we have a polysaccharide like starch or glycogen, um, we're going to have to use specific amylases to break that apart. So we have salivary amylase, we have amylase that's in our saliva that starts breaking down some of those bigger polysaccharides. We might get short branched polysaccharides or disaccharides, which are just two sugars. And so then we have very specific enzymes that are then going to come in and break those down further into monosaccharides, depending on the type of poly or disaccharide we have. So if we have dextrins, we use alpha dextrinase to break it into glucose. If we have maltose, we use maltase to break that into two glucose molecules. Sucrose is broken down into glucose and fructose using sucrase. And lactose is broken down into glucose and galactose using lactase. 
So keep in mind that even though we have many different hydrolytic enzymes uh, for these carbohydrates, not every carbohydrate that we eat, uh, we're able to break down. So um, uh, I'll get to that in just a moment, um, but just uh, remember that some of these amylases are coming from saliva and from the pancreas, um, that those other enzymes, the alpha dextrinase, maltase, sucrase, and lactase are coming from the brush border and uh, brush border, they're brush border enzymes. Um, so we have the uh, saliva and pancreas kind of breaking down this first part and then um, the completion of breakdown into monosaccharides is happening in the small intestine with those brush border enzymes. Okay, so getting into what I was saying just a moment ago about not being able to break down everything completely. Um, so when we eat anything that's plant-based that has plant cells in it, plant cell walls are made up of a molecule called cellulose. So uh, when we think about cellulose, it has all these fibers, it has these different levels of organization, and uh, it's a fibrous polysaccharide that's found in plants. So when we think about food being very rich in fiber, a lot of times we're thinking about cellulose. So again, if it ends in OSC, it's a sugar. We know that cellulose is um, involved in sugar, it's a carbohydrate, but uh, the problem is, even though it's a ton of glucose packed together, it's basically thousands of glucose monomers packed together, it's the glucose storage molecule for plants, um, we're not able to break it apart. We can't hydrolyze it because we don't have the right enzyme to break it down. Um, so we eat this cellulose as part of our diet um, because it helps kind of move stuff through, because there's other important nutrients in plants, um, and so even though we can't break it down and absorb it, it's still important for our diets. So thinking about protein and understanding how we break it down, we have to keep in mind that protein is not just you know, a simple chain. It has lots of levels of organization, and each of these levels of organization has very special bonds holding it together. We also, even if we were just looking at the primary structure of protein, a uh, long polypeptide chain, um, there's tons of different amino acids uh, that are involved there. It's not just you know a couple of uh, amino acids with sugars. We have you know a few different sugars that make these different combinations with amino acids. There's many that are involved here. So they have unique bonds between them, and then the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of protein organization have even more unique bonds. So in order to break down proteins, we have to first break apart those quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structures, um, and then eventually cleave peptide bonds in that polypeptide chain. So a huge part of this, specifically kind of breaking down those heavy, higher levels of organization, occurs in the stomach with parietal cells. So these parietal cells are kind of lining the lumen of the stomach. Um, they have proton pumps and they have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. So what carbonic anhydrase does is it forms carbonic acid um, from water and carbon dioxide. So uh, one of the uh, one of the kind of effects of climate change is this idea of ocean acidification. Um, the idea that the ocean is becoming increasingly acidic as it involves car as it uh, absorbs carbon dioxide. So water and carbon dioxide mix together to form an acid, a relatively weak acid called carbonic acid. Um, you can also see this effect if you blow bubbles into water with a pH indicator. So we have this enzymatically happening uh, in these parietal cells, um, so we're producing an acid in this way. And so um, this acid is bicarbonate and uh, a proton. Remember that acids dissociate to form protons in solution. And so this formation, this enzymatic formation of carbonic acid uh, is going to produce a bunch of protons and a bunch of bicarbonate. Uh, the protons get pumped through proton pumps into the stomach. Um, there's 
chloride ion in the interstitial fluid that's coming from your blood. Uh, and so bicarbonate is actually able to trade places with that chloride ion, pushing chloride ion also into the parietal cells and then into the lumen of the stomach. So you have water and carbon dioxide being used to form this acid, that acid dissociates, um, and then it's able to form an even stronger acid in the lumen of the stomach. And that strong acid is hydrochloric acid. So we have hydrochloric acid in the stomach. We're also changing our blood chemistry. Um, and so this acid is going to be important because it's going to start breaking down those higher levels of organization on the protein. So they're able to kind of break down hydrogen bonds and other types of bonds that are holding it together. It also activates uh, an important molecule called pepsin. And so pepsin uh, is going to be really important for chemical digestion as well. It's activated by a low pH environment, so hydrochloric acid activates it. So remember, we have 21 different amino acids that are forming these proteins that we're consuming. So we have um, a lot of differentiation of chemical digestion of proteins in different parts of our body. It has to be broken down into large polypeptides, then short peptides and amino acids, and eventually into individual amino acids. Lipid digestion um, involves breaking apart the triglyceride molecule. Remember that there's many different types of lipids that we consume, um, but oftentimes we're thinking specifically about triglycerides, which are one glycerol and three fatty acid chains. So when those are digested, it's broken up down into two free fatty acid chains. So two of those fatty acids pop off and become their own molecules. That glycerol remains attached to one fatty acid, and we call that a monoglyceride. So we end up with two free fatty acids and one monoglyceride through lipid digestion. Some of that digestion is happening in the stomach. We have lingual and gastric lipases that are involved there, but most lipid digestion occurs in the small intestine from pancreatic lipase that is excreted and pumped out by the pancreas, or secreted and pumped out by the pancreas. For nucleic acid digestion, uh, we have a breakdown not just into monomers, but even further. So remember that the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. Uh, we'll talk about their structure in just a moment. So we have pancreatic nucleases. Um, so we have deoxyribonuclease, which breaks down DNA. We have ribonuclease, which breaks down RNA. And those are getting broken down into their monomers nucleotides. But the nucleases are just one piece of the puzzle. We also have nucleosidase and phosphatase, which are brush border enzymes. Those are gonna break down those nucleotides even further. So if we look at this nucleotide and we zoom in on it, um, remember that a nucleotide helps build up a sugar phosphate backbone, and it also has a nitrogenous base. So we have a pentose sugar, we have a phosphate, and we also have a nitrogenous base, those C's, G's, A's, and T's. So here we have that pentose sugar that is going to get broken apart. We have the phosphate that's also gonna get separated and the nitrogenous base that's going to get separated as well. So it's not enough to just break it down into the nucleotides. These are broken down further into pentose sugars phosphates and nitrogenous bases before they are absorbed. So those were the different macromolecules. Um, thinking about this as an overall physiological process, we have specific phases of digestion. Um, you should be familiar with the names of the phases and what specifically they do. So for example, the cephalic phase prepares the mouth and stomach for food. You don't need to memorize the physiology. Um, so all of these can either stimulate some stomach secretory activity or inhibit it, uh, depending on different signals. Um, but you don't need to memorize all of that. You just need to understand what is the purpose of this phase. So the cephalic phase prepares the mouth and stomach for food. Um, this is involved a lot with the neural system, so thinking about the sight or thought of food, um, stimulating taste and smell receptors. Um, so that's going to serve to prepare the mouth and stomach. 
Then we have the gastric phase um, that is happening when stuff actually reaches the stomach. Um, so we have a promotion of gastric secretion and motility through neural and hormonal mechanisms. So it's not just neural, it's also hormonal involved as well. And then finally, once uh, chyme reaches the intestinal phase, we have the inhibition of the release of chyme from the stomach and promotion of digestion in the small intestine, again, through neural and hormonal mechanisms. So after digestion, uh, we have absorption. And so um, remember that the small intestine is crucial for this process. Uh, it's crucial for chemical digestion. It's also crucial for absorption. So almost all macronutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. 80% of electrolytes and 90% of water are absorbed here as well. So I think growing up, a lot of us are taught that the large intestine absorbs water and the small intestine absorbs nutrients. 90% of water is absorbed in the small intestine. So on the right here, you can see kind of uh, the fluid that's involved in digestion at different parts of the alimentary canal. Um, 7,800 mils per day are reabsorbed through the small intestine. And we compare that to about 1,250 mils that are being absorbed in the large intestine. So depending on different properties of the nutrient, absorption is going to occur a little bit differently. So if we have water-soluble nutrients, those can't really easily pass through the plasma membrane. Remember that the middle of the plasma membrane is very hydrophobic, um, the tails of that phospholipid bilayer. There's also tight junctions between epithelial cells, um, and so these nutrients have to get into the interstitial fluid and then into the capillaries in different ways. Um, those are eventually kind of transported out to the liver through the hepatic portal system for processing. Lipids are different. Um, lipid soluble nutrients are able to pass through the plasma membrane, um, but then they're packaged and they travel through the lymphatic system. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So again, remember that for those water soluble nutrients, those are gonna make their way to the hepatic portal system. So when we're thinking about different mechanisms of absorption, we have passive or simple diffusion. Um, remember that's just kind of a general property of a molecule moving along its own concentration gradient. We have facilitated diffusion, which is also passive. It doesn't cost the cell any energy. Um, depending on whether we have a channel or a carrier protein, uh, cells or um, material can pass through the cell membrane without using any energy. There's also active transport, which does cost energy. We have co-transport, which is uh, secondary active transport. Um, we have ATP being used in some way, but then that creates a concentration gradient that is then leveraged to transport material. So it's secondary active transport. And we also have endocytosis. And so that is more of a bulk transport process where we have pinching off of the cell membrane. So going through and talking about each macronutrient in turn, um, remember that carbohydrates are digested down into monosaccharides. And so absorption happens um, on monosaccharides. Glucose and galactose, we already talked about, those are going to enter um, epithelial cells using secondary active transport, like we mentioned earlier. They then leave those cells through facilitated diffusion. So they get into the epithelial cells lining the lumen of the small intestine through secondary active transport. They leave those cells to then travel through circulation um, using facilitated diffusion. So we have glucose and galactose. We also have fructose. So fructose is absorbed in the small intestine directly through facilitated diffusion. We also have protein absorption. Uh, remember that's happening on amino acids. Sometimes dipeptides and tripeptides are also absorbed. That's happening in the duodenum and jejunum, and those also use secondary active transport. For nucleic acids, remember that those are not left as nucleotides. They're broken into those pentose sugars, phosphate groups, and nitrogenous bases. Um, and so those final products are actively transported by carriers 
uh, across the epithelium of villi, so across the epithelium lining those villi, um, and into the bloodstream. So those rely on active transport. And then water um, is absorbed in the small intestine as well, primarily. Um, this pie chart is showing you that there's about 6.7 liters of fluid from uh, GI secretions entering the small intestine every day, and 2.3 liters from our diet, so uh, either from food or beverages. And again, 90% of that water is absorbed through passive diffusion in the small intestine. Um, when water is diffusing, we call that osmosis. Um, most of the remainder is absorbed in the large intestine, and unless you have um, pretty serious gut issues or have diarrhea, um, most of the water is going to get absorbed there. A, a huge portion of it should not be leaving your body. So continuing on with micronutrients, most electrolytes, most minerals are absorbed using active transport and they are continuously absorbed uh, whether you really need them or not. The distinction is with iron and calcium. So focusing first on iron, um, we have iron transport proteins that get upregulated or downregulated, so embedded or taken out from our intestines. Um, they increase in number when you need more iron. They decrease in number when you have enough iron. So iron absorption is controlled homeostatically. Same with calcium. Uh, we have parathyroid hormone that is released from the parathyroid gland. Um, that's going to increase calcium reabsorption from bones and kidneys. It also indirectly increases intestinal absorption of calcium um, by changing some stuff in our um, excretory system and kind of affecting vitamin D signaling. Um, so we have an increase in intestinal absorp absorption of calcium. In terms of vitamin absorption, all the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K are absorbed the same way as dietary lipids, which we'll get to in the next slide. Uh, water soluble vitamins are absorbed with simple diffusion. So the same way that water is absorbed um, vitamin B12 is kind of unique. We have this molecule called intrinsic factor that is produced in our stomach. Um, so vitamin B12 doesn't get digested and broken down. It binds to this intrinsic factor. The intrinsic factor protects it um, and it keeps it kind of as this big aggregate until it gets into the ileum in the small intestine and then it undergoes endocytosis to bring it into our cells. So uh, that's important to keep in mind because we can't synthesize vitamin B12 on our own. It's something that we have to get from our diet, and we can only get it from um, other animals. So uh, that's something that vegans and vegetarians have to kind of recognize that that's an important vitamin to get from dietary sources. So thinking about multivitamins and stuff like that. So lipids have to be absorbed um, kind of in a different way than other macronutrients. 95% um, of lipids are absorbed in the small intestine, and again, it's through kind of a different mechanism. So we have those triglycerides being broken down into two free fatty acids and a monoglyceride, and then they go through this process of emulsion um, and micelle formation. So what micelles are, are um, kind of this... Uh, uh, when you have a amphipathic molecule, so something like um, a phospholipid that has a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion, um, they spontaneously form these bubbles called micelles. And so if you've ever used uh, micellar water to remove makeup or to clean your face, um, the hydrophobic portion kind of binds to oil or other residue, different makeup, stuff like that, and then the hydrophilic portion is going to help you kind of remove it using water or an aqueous solution. Um, and so these micelles just kind of spontaneously form. Um, so they form here using bile salts from the liver. And then we have the formation of chylomicrons. Um, I'll show you that structure in just a moment. These are masses of triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol with a protein coat. Um, so kind of moving the triglycerides through the cells using these chylomicrons. 
they make their way into the lymphatic system uh, using lacteals. So lacteals are the word that we use for lymphatic vessels of the small intestine. Remember that lymph uh, lymphatic capillaries and lymphatic vessels are very important for uh, draining and recirculating interstitial fluid. Um, so once we get into that interstitial fluid, it's going to get picked up by the lymphatic um, capillaries and vessels, the lacteals, and then recirculate. So not necessarily going through the hepatic portal system the way that other macronutrients do. So here's the structure of a chylomicron. Uh, you can see the triglycerides, um, the phospholipids surrounding them, so that amphipathic molecule with the um, hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. It's not forming a bilayer the way that a cell would, but it's still forming a protective structure. Okay, so getting into chapter 24, thinking about what happens after absorption is completed, how do these uh, different molecules get metabolized, and how do we use them for nutrition. When we're going through this, you should first focus on anabolism versus catabolism. So recognizing a reaction as anabolic or catabolic, and also recognizing specific hormones as anabolic or catabolic. As we talk about uh, carbohydrate metabolism and different metabolic states of the body, you should recognize what metabolic processes happen depending on what metabolic state you're in. Um, for lipid and protein metabolism, you should recognize specific processes. Um, for protein, uh, well, for lipid, we'll talk specifically about a case study. Um, and then for energy and heat balance, that's very brief. You just need to know the definition of basal metabolic rate. Okay, so when we're thinking about metabolism, um, I think people kind of have uh, misinterpretations or misconceptions about what this is because of how we use it kind of in day-to-day -day activities. Um, when we do a Google search for the term fast metabolism, we think about our diet, we think maybe about people who don't store a lot of fat, who tend to be skinnier. Um, so we grow up hearing these terms, but are maybe not using them in the most scientific way. So when we're thinking about metabolism in the context of biology, this is the sum of all chemical reactions within a living organism that transform energy and matter. So it's all chemical reactions. It's not necessarily fast or slow. It's just biochemically what's happening in your body. And it involves a lot of cycling between what we call anabolism and catabolism. Um, we have cycling of stored energy, um, so kind of building things up and breaking them down, releasing heat and other waste products, and taking in nutrients to continue the cycle. So when we're thinking about catabolic pathways or catabolic reactions, these are catastrophic. They're taking a macromolecule and breaking it apart into simple, simpler molecules. Remember that energy is stored in bonds. So when you break bonds, you release energy. So uh, this is kind of like spending money. You have a full wallet and you're going to take out money to use. Anabolic pathways or anabolic reactions are putting money into your wallet. You have simple molecules, you're going to use energy to put bonds between those simpler molecules and build up a macromolecule. So these are also called biosynthesis reactions. Um, you can think about anabolic steroids, which are used to build muscle. So anabolism builds up macromolecules. So for the exam and for the next quiz, you should definitely recognize these definitions. So when I'm talking about kind of a full versus an empty wallet, um, usually we're talking about ATP as that wallet. So um, ATP is the currency of the cell. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. That tri part is important um, because we have three inorganic phosphate groups. Uh, when we pop one of those off, we convert this to ADP or adenosine diphosphate. Um, so we uh, release energy and then we spend energy to build up those ATP stores again.
that energy from ATP is what's going to drive all of our bodily functions. So there's many different processes by which we can get ATP depending on what resources we have and our metabolic state. Um, ideally, we use carbohydrates in order to get energy. Um, so this graphic here is showing the relationship between catabolism, anabolism, and different macronutrients, specifically proteins, carbs, and triglycerides from our food intake. So usually we use carbohydrates. Um, sometimes we can use fats, depending on the state that we're in. Um, fat storage is really energy dense, uh, but it's not necessarily what our body reverts to all the time. We can also use proteins, but this is less ideal. Okay, so when we're thinking about the hormones that we use to accomplish different types of metabolism, um, these are the catabolic hormones. So you should recognize cortisol, glucagon, adrenaline, and epinephrine as catabolic hormones used to accomplish catabolism. So cortisol specifically increases blood glucose levels, uh, encourages a process called gluconeogenesis. So we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Glucagon increases blood glucose levels by breaking down glycogen in our liver. Um, glucagon works with insulin to form a negative feedback loop, um, and so this is going to maintain homeostasis. Adrenaline and epinephrine stimulate gluconeogenesis um, like cortisol. Uh, they also um, are involved with sympathetic nervous system responses. These are the anabolic hormones. So we have uh, growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor, um, so GH and IGF. Um, so these are going to be building stuff up. GH stimulates growth of cells, tissue, and bone. IGF stimulates muscle and bone growth. Again, insulin works opposite of glucagon. It promotes uptake of glucose from the blood and stores it in the liver and muscle as glycogen. Estrogen and testosterone um, are sex hormones. Estrogen is important for increasing metabolism and fat deposition, so building up fat and storing it. Testosterone is important for increasing muscle mass and bone strength. So remember, catabolism is important for extracting energy. So we have these nutrients that we're taking into our body, we break them apart into simpler molecules, and we get access to energy that way. Um, just covering a few more terms that might help make sense of some of the processes that we're going to be talking about. A lot of these involve redox reactions. Uh, keep in mind that you don't need to memorize every step of every cycle that we're talking about. You should just kind of know what the cycles accomplish. This is not a biochemistry class, so you don't need to know the whole Krebs cycle, um, but understanding ideas like redox are helpful in understanding how these processes work. Um, so when we're talking about redox reactions, uh, we have reduction and oxidation reactions. One way to, res uh, to remember this is um, Leo Gur, so um, Leo the lion says Gur. Uh, Leo stands for lose electron oxidation. Uh, Gur stands for gain electron reduction. So we have kind of this movement of electrons and protons. We also call this dehydrogenation. So we have kind of like this game of hot potato that's being played in these redox reactions. There's other energy carrier molecules involved as well. So when you look at some of these cycles, um, this picture here is photosynthesis, so obviously not happening inside our bodies, um, but there are other energy carrying molecules other than ATP. Um, there's the FADH2, NADH, and NADPH. Um, like ATP, they have unstable bonds, so we're able to temporarily store energy, um, pop off one of those uh, moieties, and break a bond in order to access that energy. But ATP is the most important energy carrying molecule. Um, this image is just kind of, again, visualizing that cycling between ATP and ADP. Another way to think about it other than a full wallet versus an empty wallet is a charged battery versus a dead battery. Um, so when we have these series of oxidation reduction reactions, um, ideally we're trapping some of that energy as ATP so that we can then use it for 
uh, different cell processes. So thinking about glucose um, so, and specifically carbohydrate metabolism, um, thinking about what might happen to glucose after carbohydrates have been digested and absorbed, uh, that glucose might go on to be involved in ATP production, in amino acid synthesis, in glycogen synthesis through glycogenesis, or in triglyceride synthesis. So notice that uh, different components of macromolecules don't kind of exist on their own. They can be used to build building blocks of other types of macronutrients. So in thinking about different processes involved in carbohydrate metabolism, the first that you should be thinking about is this process of glycolysis in which we produce pyruvate from glucose. So um, this uh, is, can be done pretty quickly. It's uh, not dependent on oxygen. We spend two ATP, but we make four ATP. So we end up getting a net gain of two ATP. Um, it relies on available glucose in the bloodstream, but it is a way to get access to ATP fairly quickly, even though it's small amounts. This gets integrated with the idea of cellular respiration, where we have other processes um, like the transition reactions involving acetyl-CoA. Uh, we have the Krebs cycle, um, which is producing quite a bit of ATP, um, and then the electron transport chain, which is producing a ton of ATP. So um, we have this huge set of metabolic reactions that are going to convert that biochemical energy from nutrients into ATP and release waste products like carbon dioxide. Um, so this is going to, again, involve glycolysis. Um, it's going to involve the formation of acetyl-CoA. Keep that acetyl-CoA in mind because it's going to come into play with the metabolism of a lot of other uh, macronutrient constituents as well. Um, other words for the Krebs cycle include TCA and the citric acid cycle. Those are all synonymous. Um, and then the electron transport chain reactions are also called oxidative phosphorylation. Many different reactions have electron transport chains. So even though we usually think about it in terms of cellular respiration, it's more accurate to call it oxidative phosphorylation. So we also have this process of gluconeogenesis. Um, this is where we synthesize glucose from pyruvate, lactate, glycerol, alanine, or glutamate. Um, when you think about that word gluconeogenesis, so gluco is glucose, uh, neo is new, and genesis is formation. So this is kind of de novo formation of glucose. We're forming glucose from other completely different molecules. So it's not coming from a dietary source of glucose. We're forming it from something else. In terms of uh, carbohydrate metabolism, we also have these different processes that involve glycogen. So the anabolic process is glycogenesis, again, generating glycogen. Um, so this is the synthesis, the formation of glycogen um, by storing glucose as glycogen. You can see the glycogen molecule in the top right. That's how our bodies store glucose. Um, so glycogenesis is anabolic. Glycogenolysis, so lysis is splitting, is catabolic. We're breaking down glycogen to make glucose um, in our muscle and our liver cells. Um, so the muscle cells do this during fight or flight when you need a rapid supply of glucose. Our liver cells do this when we have low blood glucose levels. So in thinking about when those different carbohydrate metabolic processes happen, a lot of that is dependent on what metabolic state we're in. So when we talk about the absorptive state, that is also called the fed state. Um, so this is when we're ingesting food, we're processing it, we're absorbing nutrients, um, and so we're able to build more than we have to break apart. Anabolism is exceeding catabolism. In the post-absorptive state, this is also called the fasting state, this might happen um, overnight as you're sleeping and not necessarily eating, or if you do intermittent fasting during the day. Um, so catabolism is going to exceed anabolism. You're breaking apart more than you're building. 
and this is exaggerated in starvation states where you go into survival mode. Um, so again, catabolism is exceeding anabolism, but you're using much different catabolic pathways um, and it's pretty destructive. So in the absorptive state, um, we're really focusing on glycolysis, cellular respiration, and glycogenesis. Uh, this starts with absorption and lasts for up to four hours, or starts with ingestion, sorry, and lasts for up to four hours after ingestion. Um, so in this case, we have ready supply of glucose from our diet. Um, we're absorbing that glucose into our tissue. The blood glucose is going to rise and it's going to trigger the, trigger the release of insulin. Um, glucose gets absorbed by our liver cells, um, adipose and muscle cells, and then it gets immediately converted into glucose 6-phosphate. So this maintains a concentration gradient where we can keep absorbing glucose into those cells. And then it's eventually stored as glycogen. So again, we have an anabolic process, glycogenesis, where we're building up that bigger macromolecule. So in the absorptive state, again, we have glycolysis, cellular respiration, and glycogenesis. In the post-absorptive state, this is after food has already been digested, absorbed, and stored. You're not ingesting more food. Um, so your blood glucose and your insulin levels are going to drop, and you're going to start relying more on our stored glycogen. So here we still have glycolysis happening, and we for sure have cellular respiration happening, but we're becoming increasingly dependent on glycogenolysis, so splitting apart glycogen, and also gluconeogenesis, where we're building up new stores of, gluco uh, of uh, glucose, not from our diet, but from other molecules. So glucagon is released. Um, again, it's working opposite of insulin. Um, it's going to inhibit glycogenesis, so we're going to stop storing glucose as glycogen. Instead, we're going to stimulate glycogenolysis and break apart that glycogen. We're going to go through gluconeogenesis. We'll start creating glucose from non-diet sources, um, and that's going to continue to happen in the liver even after um, you've kind of gone through a prolonged fast and start eating again because you have to rebuild those glycogen stores. So when we get into starvation, the goal uh, that your body focuses on is getting glucose to fuel your brain and also conserving amino acids for proteins. So the body becomes increasingly dependent on ketones to meet those priorities. Um, you're not going to be using glycolysis because you are really starved for glucose. You're still going through cellular respiration, but maybe using other pathways. Um, you're going through gluconeogenesis to try to make more glucose to fuel the brain. Um, so other macronutrients, fats and proteins, are cycled into these pathways, um, and gluconeogenesis continues. So again, starvation is uh, kind of an extreme situation of that post-absorptive state. Okay, so that was carbohydrate metabolism, getting into lipid metabolism. We have um, the oxidation of fatty acids, we're generating energy or synthesizing new lipids. So we have lipolysis, that name implies splitting. Um, so we have triglycerides being hydrolyzed into glycerol and fatty acids. Um, these are eventually going to be further oxidized through a process called fatty acid oxidation or beta oxidation into acetyl-CoA. So remember, acetyl-CoA uh, was what pyruvate gets converted into in preparation for the Krebs cycle. Um, and so here we have lipids being able to enter the Krebs cycle as well. We also have lipogenesis, which is um, an anabolic pathway. Um, so this is an anabolic process in which you have maybe extra acetyl-CoA that gets converted back into fats. Um, so fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, sterols, and bile salts um, in the cytoplasm of fat cells or liver cells. So lipolysis is breaking apart triglycerides, lipogenesis is building up those fats again from extra acetyl-CoA. Ketogenesis happens when we have a lot of extra acetyl-CoA being produced from beta oxidation. That then gets converted into what are called ketone bodies um, through this process of ketogenesis. So we have a lot of extra acetyl-CoA 
some of it gets converted into ketone bodies. Those ketone bodies um, then can kind of sit around and when we have very low glucose levels, then we can use them as a fuel source. Ketone body oxidation happens when we have ketones um, that are broken down into carbon dioxide and acetone or oxidized back into acetyl-CoA. Um, one interesting thing about the carbon dioxide and acetone is when that happens, uh, people's breath get this kind of sweet alcoholic scent to it, um, and so that's from the acetone kind of airing off. So uh, one thing that I wanted you to kind of be aware of is diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so what ketoacidosis actually is, is when you get this abnormally low blood pH, so kind of acidic blood, um, which is caused by extreme or prolonged ketosis. So ketosis is when you have a really high level of ketone bodies in your blood. So usually what happens is uh, insulin inhibits lipolysis. Um, but remember that type 1 diabetics are not able to produce insulin. So uh, when we're thinking about lipolysis, um, so lipolysis is uh, the breakdown of triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids. Um, those are often then broken down into or transformed into acetyl-CoA through beta oxidation. Um, and then at, after that, we have ketogenesis in which ketone bodies are formed. So if we don't have insulin controlling this process because people with type 1 diabetes are not able to effectively produce insulin, then we have these series of reactions in which we have an accumulation of ketone bodies um, and that's causing ketoacidosis. Uh, so kind of understand that process, understand how all of those different things are related. And if you don't have um, control, if you don't have the appropriate feedback loop, you're not able to regulate that and you can cause uh, this pretty serious condition when diabetes is not appropriately regulated. Okay, so getting into protein metabolism, um, so we have breakdown into amino acids. Those are really important for many, many structures in our bodies. Remember that proteins are uh, important structural components and also functional components in the form of enzymes. Um, so when we have protein anabolism, we're able to build up those proteins. Um, so we also really rely on a lot of amino acids uh, from our diet. Those are called non-essential amino acids. Um, so, uh, Sorry, I misspoke there. Um, so essential amino acids are the ones that are um, taken in by our diet only. Non-essential amino acids are ones that we can synthesize. So they're all important, but non-essential means that we can make them from constituent pieces if we don't get them as part of our diet. Um, so the tricky thing though is that we don't have storage mechanisms for protein the way that we do for uh, lipids and carbohydrates. So we don't have a glycogen equivalent of protein. Um, so uh, we either use them to create proteins, we convert them into glucose or ketones, or we decompose them and eliminate them from our bodies. So there's a couple of different um, reactions that are kind of involved in transforming and dealing with protein pieces. Um, so transamination is anabolic. Um, it's the exchange of a group, um, specifically an amine group for a keto group. Um, so we have uh, this transamination process. Um, and so we're going to be able to kind of synthesize new proteins that way, um, produce precursors for the Krebs cycle and get rid of waste. Deamination is um, a catabolic process. So that is removing an amino group from an amino acid. You produce ammonia that gets converted into urea and excreted in the urine. So when we talk about urine having nitrogenous waste, um, it's formed through deamination, a catabolic process. So thinking about the urea cycle, that's really important for dealing with protein um, in metabolic processes because we don't have a storage mechanism for it. So we don't want it building up in our body. We want to get rid of ammonium, which is 
very dangerous and also urea. Um, so urea produced by the combination of ammonium and carbon dioxide is excreted through our kidneys. So later in the semester when we talk about excretion and kidneys and homeostasis, we'll revisit this idea. We also have the Krebs cycle being related to protein metabolism. Um, so amino acids can be processed to produce pyruvate. They can be uh, used to produce acetyl-CoA, acetoacyl-CoA, oxaloacetate, and alpha-ketoglutarate. So they can enter the Krebs cycle in different ways as well. So all of the different uh, fates of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins um, come together to create this really elaborate series of anabolic and catabolic reactions that fuel our body. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is this idea of metabolic rate, so kind of getting quantitative about this process. Um, when we're thinking about metabolic rate in general, that's the amount of energy consumed by our bodies minus the amount of energy expended by the body. Um, and then basal metabolic rate is uh, the amount of daily energy expended at rest. So it's kind of um, when things are steady, when your environment is steady, uh, when you're in a post-absorptive state, um, so not actively eating, uh, what, energy, what are your energy costs? So it's your amount of daily energy expended just to kind of keep you going. Okay, so that is everything um, in terms of digestive physiology. Please make sure you look over the mini study guide that's posted above this video um, and that you review that prior to the next quiz, which will be posted on Monday.